morning, everyone. Welcome back to the second day. We had an exciting uh, day yesterday with uh, all these different military branches. We, or I learned a, a lot of, about Navy, Cavalry, Hoplitz, Peltas. Then we turned to military practices and heard some uh, two papers about generals and one case study about Conan. So today in the morning we uh, turn to military practices part two. So we, now this, the theme, the topic of this session is um, financing wars. So we have two papers, uh, one longer paper of 50 mi 40 minutes and 20 uh, minutes discussion, then a short break, and then um, a short, uh, shorter paper uh, of 20 minutes um, so, um, about yeah, public, uh, about financing wars and institutions. So my pleasure is to introduce um, uh, two persons from Queensland. <laughs> One, uh, the first speaker is Dr. Annabel Florence. She is associate lecturer in classical languages at the University of Queensland. She is a classicist and a social historian. A historian. Annabelle's research interests include inter alia, so I concentrate on this, uh, what's um, the topic of this conference, the public finance, warfare, foreign policy, democracy, and economy of classical Athens. She wrote uh, her PhD thesis about Athens after defeat, war making and public finances, finance from 404 to 370, and today she speaks about Athens after the defeat, financing wars from 399 to 369 BC. Annabel, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, Dorothea. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, David and Ian and the Institute and Dimitri for setting everything up and for having us all here. Um, <clears throat> apologies for yesterday for having to duck out a couple of times. My voice is a little um, dodgy at the moment. I've had a bit of laryngitis, so... but. COVID-free, done a test, it's all negative, so all good. I hope my voice uh, holds out. Um, so, Claude Mosse uh, famously argued in La fin de la démocratie at the end that the inability of post-war Athens to manage well the financing of war in the fourth century contributed to its irreversible decline. Um, the blame for this she levelled squarely at the demos and its ineffective management of public finances. The assemblies of the fourth century were shambolic, and those citizens who voted on financial and military issues put their individual preferences before the security of the state. And I think, if I remember correctly, she even compares the assemblies to like the um, drunken sailors lurching from one inept decision to another. Um, in recent decades, though, much research um, has demonstrated that Athenian public finances recovered quickly in the early 4th century, um, and that it ended up being a period of wide-ranging reform. The first 30 years in particular um, uh, saw Athens fighting more often than previously, sending its infantry and navy on long campaigns across the eastern Mediterranean, a, f a tremendous financial commitment. Um, but nevertheless, the idea persists that during that period, um, Athens' financing of this new surge in warfare relied on Persia's benevolence, the heavy taxation of Athenian citizens and Athenian allies, um, and the violent extracting of money from other states by their generals on campaign. Um, consequently, so too does the idea that Athenians were incapable of making um, uh, proactive and innovative decisions necessary to defray the costs of its warfare and consequently prefer, prevent that sort of further economic decline. Um, and there's no doubt that these areas of revenue raising remained part of Athenian funding strategies. That's um, obvious in the sources. But today I want to draw attention to an often overlooked area of Athenian finance, and that's cash reserves. Um, I want to look briefly at some proactive and innovative decisions made by Athens during the first 30 years of the 4th century that suggest it was actively taking steps to generate and to, accumul uh, to accumulate surplus, surplus funds for warfare, perhaps to a greater extent than we've previously thought. So that's the reforms um, to the Isphora, the development of the Marismos, and the introduction of the Stratioitica. So the demos of classical Athens controlled the spending of the public 
uh, spending of the state's public revenues. And consequently, in both the fifth and fourth centuries, it was this group of 6,000 citizens that determined when the state would go to war, how much money would be spent on campaigning, and from where that money would come. The assembly was ably advised on the state's financial situation by the Council of 500, the Bure, um, whose job it was to scrutinize all public revenues and expenditures. And with the sharing of this knowledge, orators debating the merits of going to war, um, or uh, for negotiating a peace for that matter, emphasized as part of their arguments the costs associated with more war making and the, the ability of the state to fund them. Um, and as a result of that, the demos became uh, reasonably astute at predicting with some degree of certainty Athens' ability to cope with the financial burden of warfare. Um, the decisions made by the demos regarding the defence of Athens covered the capital, fixed and variable operating costs of its military activity. Of foremost importance to Athens as a sea power was the maintenance of a strong and fast fleet. Assembly goers were called on to decide issues such as whether the fleet was in need of new triremes, how many would be built and rigged out, um, and also whether the construction of ship sheds in which to house them was necessary. Decisions about the construction and maintenance of the walled defences surrounding Athens and Praeus were also its responsibility. And similarly, the wages um, of a permanent military force stationed at Athens were controlled by the demos. Certain costs associated with war making, however, were more unpredictable. Um, uh, and therefore more difficult to plan for. The wages bill for the state's soldiers and sailors, for example, was extremely variable. So those voting on how much to spend could not know such things as how long the hostilities would last, what the losses in men and equipment would be or would amount to, and if or when additional funding might be needed, um, how it would be managed. So despite the uncertainty, gone up a page ahead, um, despite the uncertainty, the state's ability to meet its expenditure was always a matter of concern for the demos. In the nine assembly speeches reported by Thucydides during the Peloponnesian War, over half express, expressed views on how warfare expenses will be met. During the early 4th century, an ongoing anxiety about having enough revenue to meet military costs is revealed in Adocrates' speech um, encouraging the Athenians to accept a peace with Sparta. In it, he claims that Athens does not have the resources to continue fighting its enemies. In the mid-4th century, Demosthenes um, famously sets out in detail the total cost of, of a campaign he's proposing and from precisely where the funds will come to pay for it. The people then constantly took measures to ensure that revenue continued to flow into the public purse and they monitored their income streams closely. Okay, so this ISOR is believed to be an ad hoc emergency tax um, levied by decree, usually in times of war on the city's wealthiest men, both citizens and metic. Um, Thucydides tells us in 428 that in 428 the Athenians levied the tax, which raised 200 talents during ongoing operations on Lesbos for the specific purpose of besieging Mytilene. He does not tell us um, which expenditure in particular the money covered. It could have, for example, funded an item of capital expenditure, so sort of the siege equipment, um, or it could have covered the variable cost of sending the, the thousand additional um, men over to carry out the siege construction. Um, the tax was levied at least uh, two more times in the fifth century, um, at the very least, but we don't know the reason for each one, nor um, how it was raised, nor, nor how much was raised. Um, by the first decade of the century, of the fourth century, the Isophora had become a regular levied tax. A legal speech attributed to Isaiah, written around 3989, clearly states that Isophorae Thalcitae, um, so many Isophorae have been levied um, to fund the Corinthian War and to protect the city. In another legal speech, um, one written by Lysias, sometimes um, just after 390, the speaker claims that a certain Aristophanes and his father contributed to many Isophorae over the past four or five years. In 3887, the speaker of Lysias against Ergocles sympathizes with jury members by reassuring them that he too has suffered from the oppressive taxes that have recently been levied by the demos. Um, despite these references possibly being exaggerations used in the law courts to sympathize and appeal to the jury, scholars generally accept that between 3943 and 3989, Athens levied at least four Isphorae in order to fund its military campaigns of the 390s. Now, the really interesting thing, and what I find really interesting about the levying of these Isphorae is the timing of them. Um, Athenian military campaigns during the 390s are limited to those battles at um, Haliartus, 
Nemea and Coronea, and the start of a naval expedition towards the end of the 390s, um, the one by Thrasybulus um, heading out with his 40 ships. Um, the remainder of the decade consisted of minor engagements by small forces of mercenaries and Athenian hoplites stationed at Corinth. Um, it's possible to pinpoint the years that at least three of these ice fry could have been levied, so 3943, 3932, 3921. And it's also possible to suggest a legitimate date range for the fourth and final ice fry. Um, in a speech dated to 393, Isocrates suggests that two ice fry were levied in the first, few year, the first years of the Corinthian War. Um, the Athenians were assisting the Thebans against Sparta at Haliartus in the summer of 3954. Fighting in Nemea began in the spring of 3954 and continued um, at Coronea through to the summer of 3943. Therefore, it's been assumed that in order to fund these campaigns, Athens first levied an ice for us sometime um, before this, uh, all this campaign season began, all this campaigning began. However, the speaker of Lysias 19 um, suggests that the tax began being levied sometime after Conan's victorious battle against the Spartans at Cnidus. Um, during the mid-summer of 3943. And if you call an ice for uh, by the time you collect it, the money flows in basically um, after the hostilities at Coronea have um, concluded. Um, the second ice for was likely to have been levied the following summer in 3932. Um, it had to be in the, either in the summer or the autumn of 3932 in order to fit with the claims of Isocrates' client. In the winter of spring, um, that year, um, after Agesilaus had captured Lechium, the assembly had voted to levy an epidosis, so a voluntary contribution on its citizens. Um, this suggests that perhaps an Isophora may have already been levied earlier in the year and that the demos was reluctant to impose the tax again um, so quickly and levied um, an epidosis instead, so that would place the Isophora earlier. Aristophanes' first century play assembly women, Ecclesia Suzai, indicates that the third Isophora was levied probably in the summer of 3921, more likely just after the arrest of Conan at Sardis. Um, whilst Aristophanes doesn't exactly use the, the word Isophora and doesn't expressly call the tax an Isophora, um, it was clearly a tax that had recently been levied for a specific reason, which sort of is what an Isophora, what happens with that. Um, and given that it doesn't appear to have been a voluntary contribution and was uh, imposed at a time when Athens was at war, um, it does seem to fit the general description of an ice forum. The fourth ice forum levy during this period has no conclusive date. However, the evidence from Lysias 19 again helps out, and it indicates that um, the many ice forum paid by Aristophanes, not the playwright, um, were levied um, during the four or five years after Conan's success at Cnidus in the summer. Um, Aristophanes and his father Nicophemus were executed at some point after the ships that were sailing to Cyprus were captured by the Spartan um, general in the spring of 39110. Uh, consequently, for Aristophanes to have contributed to his last ice for it must have been levied before he was captured, so sometime during early 391, 390. Therefore, we can safe to say that, well, we can say with um, we can say that the Demos may have levied an Isophora in 3943, 3932, 3931, 391, 90. Most scholars argue that the tax was levied at a minimum rate of 1% on the total taxable welfare of wealth, wealth of Athens. According to Polybius, the total taxable wealth during the 370s, which included all houses and other property throughout Attica, was valued at 5,750 talents. However, Demosthenes, a bit later on, um, states that in the three, uh, supported by Philochorus, states that in the 350s at least it was a great amount of 6,000 talents. Therefore, the ice for I um, levied during the 390s may have raised a total of 60 talents per year or 240 talents in total. Uh, on the other hand, Matthew Christ argues up until 3787 there was no evidence that Athens kept a record of the capital wealth of its citizens for the purpose of calculating ice for repayments in such a way and as it had done for um, uh, its metic population. Accepting this argument permits the possibility that Athens levied these ice for I at a set amount, just as it had done in the fifth century, like the 200 talents that um, Thucydides tells us. We also know they levied one in the very early stages after um, the Peloponnesian War to raise 100 talents to uh, pay back the Spartan uh, alone from Sparta. So they do have a history of sort of throwing a figure out there and trying to um, um, get that money in full. Uh, 
Um, but given that it's a, it seems to be a consecutive levying of um, the tax, um, you've got to wonder whether they perhaps levied it at a lesser amount at this stage, perhaps 50 or 60 talents. <coughs> so much of what I've presented here is um, speculative. The nature of the evidence presents any real accuracy in determining the specific dates for the levying of these ice fry or the expected revenues from them. It's clear from this evidence, though, that Athens didn't use these, um, the imposition of these taxes to fund its land warfare, as has traditionally been thought. The first imposition of the tax seems to have occurred after the Battle of Coronia, and it continued to be levied during a lengthy period of, milita of limited military activity. Um, it's possible that the funds were to contribute to the costs of um, rebuilding the Long Walls or, or other capital expenditure, but in the Long Walls in particular, we know the Athenians started um, that project in 395 and appeared to stop funding in um, 3932 when Conan, and Conan arrived in Athens to complete the task. Therefore, the imposition of these consecutive ice fry could suggest that Athens was systematically building up uh, its cash reserves in order to finance a larger military objective, um, such as the building of a new fleet. And this uh, would represent a new way of using the ice fry um, and a change in the way the demos is thinking about funding its military expenditure. We do know around this same time, um, the Athenian naval campaigns began in 3910 when Thrasybulus sailed out of the Piraeus with 40 brand new triremes. The cost to build them and fit them out um, was around one talent, um, uh, 1,234 drachma. Um, so 40 triremes of each, so 40 triremes would then have required a total capital outlay by the state of 48, of at least 48 talents. So Athens hadn't involved itself in naval combat for 15 years and was left with just the 12 triremes at the end of the Peloponnesian War. The launch of Thrasybulus's fleet marked the beginning of four years of intense seaborne um, war making. Um, and over the course of the Corinthian War, triremes departed from the Piraeus over 116 times. By the end, um, Athens had a fleet of at least 67 triremes, um, or about 13,400 men and 2,000 peltists on active duty spread as far south as Cyprus and as far north as the Proconnesus. Therefore, it would have been necessary for the state to build most, if not all, um, of these ships, and, and of course, the ship sheds associated with their construction. Um, the 370s, on the other hand, was a decade dominated by naval warfare, the cost of which was um, enormous. Um, the very opening of hostilities, uh, at the very opening of hostilities in 3787, the Demos, Demos made two significant reforms to the ISRA. Firstly, it introduced a system whereby groups of 15 taxpayers were banded together in what was called a simoria. Each group was responsible for one one hundredth of the total value of the tax levied by the Demos. Secondly, wealthy citizens were required to submit an estimate of their visible capital wealth, their timema. This was recorded by the group's secretary, and each, each taxpayer would then contribute a share of the total amount owed by the simoria proportionate to his share of the simoria's to total capital wealth. By calculating the tax um, owed by its citizens in such a way, the demos uh, was striving to ease um, the tax burden on the less wealthy and place a heavier share on those who could best afford it. The idea to create these simmeries, though, um, and to register taxable um, capital wealth of citizens was not a new one. Athenian metics had been subjected to the same conditions since at least 3943. And whilst reforming the citizen system made the collection of the ice floor simpler, easier, and more efficient, the reforms also provided a mechanism to record officially the capital wealth of each of um, each citizen in order to distribute the tax more fairly, and in the process attempt to ensure that the tax was indeed able to be paid and the full amount collected. Because as we know, there was a lot of tax evasion going on as well. So this sort of tried to um, uh, stop that. Importantly, from a financial administration perspective, these registered provi registers provided the demos with information invaluable to the financing of war. And in effect, they could be used as um, a budgeting tool. Um, the value of the total amount of visible capital recorded was clearly no secret. The boule then, knowing Athens' financial situation, was able to advise the demos more accurately on how much um, revenue would be generated by the levying of an ice floor. Athens no longer needed to levy the tax at an amount it hoped to raise for military expenditure, only to fall considerably short, as had happened previously. 
Um, this measure also appears, according to Demosthenes, to have allowed the demos to control the rate at which the tax was levied. Knowing in advance how much revenue an ISFA would generate allowed the demos to plan its military expenditure and to use the tax when it was needed most. Therefore, the decision to reform the ISFA demonstrates the demos proactively engaged in preparing for the state's future war making. What we don't know is uh, when the ice furrow may have been levied during this period. Xenophon tells us that before the common peace in the 370s that the um, ice furrow was, that the, the Athenians were um, weary of, of the ice furrow being levied. Um, so clearly several, uh, more than one at least. Um, but scholars are generally inclined to think it was, the imposition was constant. Um, and I think this depends then in too, in part, on the state's surplus revenues and any cash reserves it may hold. Um, this brings me to the Merismos and one of the most significant reforms to the organisation of the Athenian financial system during the 4th century. Um, with the loss of imperial income at the end of the Peloponnesian War, it was imperative that the Athenians thought carefully about where to spend their money and that they planned accordingly. First attested in an inscription dated to 3876, the Marismos allocated specific revenues or a portion of those revenues to specific areas of public expenditure. So it's a form of um, budgeting. Um, each of these areas was administered by a board of magistrates who then drew on allocated funds to make necessary payments, um, which expenditure received a portion of which revenue was determined according to a set of laws. Therefore. The demos could only change an allocation through the lengthy process of amending the relevant law. Um, so this fairly uncomplicated process gave the demos greater control over how much money was being spent and where. And it gave them um, a lot more um, information about what was going on, like where they were spending their money. Um, the inscription indicates that the law to allocate the revenues in such a way was in place by 386. Therefore, its introduction um, was um, somewhat earlier. However, the development of the Marismos was slow. Its progression was driven by the necessity of the demos to create new funds to receive specific allocations when the need arose. So we see funds um, uh, for the first time appearing in, for example, 3687, uh, three, um, a special fund for the expenses of the assembly was created, and a fund specifically used for the boule that could be dated to the 350s um, also appears later. So this progressive development of Marismos indicates that ensuring income met expenditure was an ongoing concern of Demos. Um, so it was an, clearly an effective and successful budgeting tool as more and more funds were set up to receive an allocation of revenue, so it's, it's working for them. Um, the demos gained better control over its money and a greater awareness of where it was being spent, allowing a greater potential um, to generate surpluses and accrue cash reserves. Um, traditionally, scholars have argued that early 4th century Athens were not able to generate annual surplus revenues after its defeat in the Peloponnesian War. And the, the importance, though, of, um, to the Athenians of having money specifically set aside for war making is demonstrated in the public, public discourse of the classical period. According to Thucydides, the Athenians passed a decree to set aside a reserve of 1,000 talents on the Acropolis, specifically to use against a naval assault on the city. It was forbidden to use this money for any other purpose or attempt, or, and any attempt to do so was punishable by debt. Before the start of the Peloponnesian War, Pericles declared that sur surpluses maintained a war more than anything else. He also famously reassured the assembly that in the unlikely event that the annual income from its allies ran out, um, with cash reserves and um, treasures accumulated on the Acropolis, Athens had more than enough in reserve to defend itself. It's one of the strategies used by Andocrates in his attempt to persuade the Athenians to accept a peace from the Spartans was to stress the potential to accumulate a sig significant amount of cash when the state's revenues were not depleted by military expenditure. So during the 390s, as the decade progressed, the annual internal revenues of the state increased. For example, harbour taxes, the harbour tax revenue um, jumped 20% immediately after the restoration of the, the democracy. So this revenue would have continued to increase through the 390s as the importance of Piraeus continued to grow as a centre for trade in the Aegean. At some point during the first decade of the fourth century, total annual revenues had increased sufficiently to fund the introduction of assembly pay um, and then to... Um, increase that 
um, to three ovals um, per day um, at an annual cost of the state of 20 talents um, in 392. Therefore, Athens was clearly generating more revenue um, each year than was required to cover the regular annual fixed operating costs of the state. Heading into the 380s, Thrasybulus's reinstatement of the 10% tax on shipping from the Bosporus, originally imposed by Alcibiades in 410, and the imposition of a 5% import-export tax on Thassos and Clazomena and some other areas, um, would have the potential to generate substantial revenues for Athens. Thucydides claims that the Ecoste um, levied in the 5th century was expected to bring in greater revenue than the Foros. Um, exactly how much revenue these taxes raised during the 390s and 380s is unknown. I mean, Clazomenae returned um, to Persian control um, with the coming of the common, uh, with the king's peace, with the common peace, or with the peace anyway. Um, so those taxes would have disappeared, I assume. Um, Estimates suggest, and these are, Vincent, these are your estimates, actually, um, that the tax on uh, 400,000 medimnoi of grain, which Demosthenes says was annually imported from the Pontic region, alone could have raised around 200,000 drachma, or 33 talents. And this estimate relies, uh, relates only to grain and only to one destination. So by using amounts received from the levying of the Pentecoste, the 2% tax at the end of the 5th century as a base, we can better speculate on the potential size of the revenue raised. This tax, levied by the state on imports and exports in and out of the press, raised 30 talents in 4021 and 36 in the following year. In both years, the tax farmers collecting the revenue were able to make a profit. Um, as cargoes were taxed incoming, uh, coming into the harbour and going out, this suggests the total value of imported goods was 750 talents in 4021 and 900 talents in 401, um, 400. We use 900 talents as a minimum estimate of the value of cargoes entering press in 390.89, and if we assume that all of these cargoes came from Thassos, Clasomenae, or the Bosporus, oh dear, um, the external revenue raised by Athens could have been around 90. So, um, importantly, not all cargoes entering and leaving Thassos and Clasomenae or departing the Bosporus ended up at Athens. <coughs> Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and my name is uh, Annabelle Florence, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I thank Ian and David, um, and uh, uh, while um, uh, the real Annabelle uh, uh, Florence might be spluttering and coughing, clearly Athenian public finances in the early in the early fourth century were not spluttering; they're going from strength to strength. Thank so, you. if you're Annabelle, do you have the pronoun they? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> Thus, it is likely that the taxes imposed by Thrasybulus in 391-390 generated more than, good that you're sitting down, 90 talents in annual income. Again, this is, a, this is all very speculative, but the idea here is to suggest that Athens was generating more revenue each year than was required to cover the regular annual fixed operating costs of the state and potentially had access to more surplus or unallocated revenue each year than we have previously thought. We know that these revenues were eventually allocated to the Strati Altica, the military fund, indicating that saving for military expenditure was a priority of the Maris Mas. Next section, the Strati Altica. In the late 5th century, Athenian imperial revenues set aside for warfare expenditure were held in a fund administered by a group called the Eleno Tamii, the treasurers of Greece. These treasurers disappear about 403, 402. Generally, so too does the belief that Athens had a specific fund set aside to pay for its military expenditure. George Cortwell argued that because warfare continued throughout the fourth century, a fund similar to the one administered by the Eleno Tamii must have existed. An inscription dated to 374, 373, page 11, provides the evidence that by the 370s at, the late, at least, the Athenians did indeed use such a fund to pay their military expenses. The inscription provides the details of a law that reforms the tax on the grain production of Lemnos, Ibnos, and Skyros. The primary purpose of this law was to ensure that that grain was publicly available 
to the Athenian people at an affordable price. However, it specifically directs any profits made in the sale of grain from Lemnos, Imbros, and Skyros to the Stratiotica, the military fund. This fund, administered by its own treasurer, not only held the state's annual surplus revenues, but the collected war taxes and any booty acquired on military campaigns. The dating of the law to 374-373 is significant. It means that the discussions about the law, the decisions about its purpose, and in particular what to do with the money made from the sale of the grain occurred sometime during the first 12 months of the common peace from 375 to 374 BC. Importantly, the value of the profit to be transferred to the military fund illustrates that this reform was not a quick fix in response to a specific event. At a maximum of just 20 talents, the amount is not large. The law is clearly first and foremost focused on providing grain at a cheap price for the demos, for the people. However the, however, the allocation of profits, no matter how small, specifically to the Stratiotica, demonstrates that the demos acknowledged the need to continue accruing cash reserves for war making. Clearly, this is proactive and innovative forward planning by the Athenian demos. But despite, but, Despite the date of the inscription being 374, 373, the creation of the Stratiotica itself was sometime, sometime before this, probably in the 390s, or even at the turn of the century. An exact date of the fund's creation has proven, of course, elusive. Writing well before the discovery of the above-mentioned inscription, Corkwell, using Demosthenes and other sources, currently argued that the Stratiotica was being used in the 370s. In a note to his discussion, Corkwell suggests that because Athens was at war in the first decade of the 4th century, the Athenians must, page 12, have placed money, have placed money raised specifically for military purposes into a fund similar to that which had the, Hel the Hellenotamii had administered. He then uh, uh, argued that uh, whatever fund was used to hold these revenues in the 370s was therefore more than likely created in the 390s for this purpose. If we look back at the 390s and the timing of those eyes for eye, Athens was able to defray the costs of the battles of Haliartus, Nemea, and Coronea without levying the tax or calling for any extraordinary contributions. The cost of sending soldiers to these battles was around 210 talents in total. This suggests that the Demos had access to surplus revenue. Once Athens had begun accruing surplus revenues and then levying ice for rye during these periods of little military action, it would have been essential for record-keeping purposes that a fund to which, uh, to allocate the fund, this money uh, uh, were created. Even more so in the 380s. This decade, although it began with a period of naval warfare, saw trade in the Piraeus boom, while Greece enjoyed nine years of peace. The potential for the accumulation of unallocated funds in the Stratiotic Arc during this period is considerable. Athenians well, were well aware of the positive effects of peacetime on the state's economy and had a history of using these periods to accrue funding for future warfare. There is no reason for the early 4th century to have been any different. This means that Athens could have started the decade of the 370s using its own revenue to pay for its military expenditure. The implications of Athens having access to cash reserves is really significant. It brings into question much of the accepted thinking about military finance in the early 4th century. 
did the accrual of the cash reserves influence the rejection of Andocades' peace plan? Is the role of Persia in Athenian military finance less than we thought? Did the accumulated surplus revenue of the 380s reduce the need for the imposition of the ICE-4R to finance the military campaigns of the 370s? Or indeed, the necessity for its generals to raise revenue on campaign through violent means? When David and Ian, I don't know who they are, asked me to consider the effectiveness of, of Athens's reforms to the financing of war, my initial thought was to present a paper based on a series of tables showing essentially the military profit and loss statements of the city state for each of the early fourth century. But what would have meant, but that would have meant endless talk about troop numbers, I quite like that, <laughs> and pay rates and capital, fixed and variable operating costs. A tedious task for an audience to listen to. My aim then was to draw attention to the potential impact of surplus revenues on the financing of war through the proactive and innovative decisions made by the people of Athens, the reforms to the ice for art, the introduction of the Marismos and the creation of the Stratiotica. These were new ideas put in place to replicate a key feature of military finance from the 5th century, cash reserves. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to introduce uh, Misha Piankosh, also from the University of Queensland. He's now writing a PhD thesis about archaic Athens at war with David Bridget as his supervisor. His research focus on the development of archaic institutions and Athens' success in war during the 6th century. Today he speaks about Naukaroi and Naukarii, the purpose of one of the oldest Athenian institutions. Misha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dorothea. Uh, before I start, I would also like to thank uh, David and Ian for inviting me. And like the other speakers, I will not be speaking about 4th century Athens or Claude Mosse. I will be talking about the 6th century Athenian institution. So, Herodotus mentions that during Chiron's conspiracy, the issue was taken care of by the Naukwaroi, but it's unclear whom these people exactly are. And over time, uh, what I would like to call an orthodox view has established, this orthodox view was first proposed by August Burke in 1817 and has over time become the dominant view. So uh, scholars who still uh, uh, argue for this position uh, today, for instance, are Stephen Lambert, uh, Thomas Figueroa, and Hans von Weiss, among others. So what the proponents of this view argue is that the Nakwaroi uh, provided ships were military commanders and local administrators all at once in the 6th century. This is based on a cherry picking of two sources, namely Julius Pollux and an entry in the Lexica Segeriana. Of course, this institution existed, uh, well its heyday was during the 6th century BC, and if you look at the dates of these sources, uh, well, the first thing that should, uh, you should notice is that these are very late sources to start with. Any other sources that mention the Nakwaroi are treated ancillary, despite the fact they might be much older, and in some cases much later. To be clear, the oldest sources we have in the Nakwaroi are some Salonian fragments, and the latest sources we have is a Byzantine lexicographer called uh, Thomas Magister, which means sources on this institution cover 20 centuries, and are thus all over the place. But how does the orthodox view come to this position? Well, they have four main arguments. Firstly, they argue that the etymology of Narquaros is chiphead. Therefore, they have to provide chips. Makes sense. They argue that further naval obligations are derived from Pollux, who argues that the Narquarii, that's the territorial entity which the Narquaroi uh, administer, had to provide ships. Then we have the entry of the Alexica Segeriana, who says that the Narcoroi are providers and commanders of ships. Then we have a fragment of Clydemos, who's 4th century BC, 
who compares Naquarii to Samorii, about which Annabel also briefly spoke. And of course, in the 6th century, Athens starts to expand a lot into the northern Aegean. Athens does have some naval capacity. Military obligations of this institute are once again derived from Pollux and the Lexica Sigiriana. Pollux notes that the Naquarii have to provide horses, and the Lexica states that they are directly subordinate to the Polemarch. And of course, there's Herodotus, who notes that the Naquarii are in charge during Cardon's coup. And lastly, this institute is also tasked with the collection of Isforba. Lastly, administrative obligations are derived once again from Pollux and the Atenine Politeia, whom both argue that these are subdivisions of the pre cleisthenic triches. Lastly, we have Androtion, who supports this idea by noting that the Naquaric Dinakwa, fund is used for sacred embassies. So mix this all together and you'll have a local official that at the same time provides ships, has a leading position in the army, and is a local administrator at once. However, this of course has received its fair share of criticism over time. Firstly, the etymology has been disputed. Secondly, the earliest sources described the Naquaroi only as local administrators. Thirdly, the role of the Naquaroi during Carlon's coup is uh, dependent on the interpretation of the verb nemo. Uh, but it also gets a bit more interesting because adherents of the orthodox view, they have not really engaged a lot with these criticisms. At best, they've noted them, but there has been little engagement with it. Before I continue, I would also like to point out that one of these main revisionists is among us in this room, namely Vincent Gabrielson, who has received a second shout out today already for his outstanding work. So in this presentation, I will be revisiting these critiques. I'll first discuss the etymology, then the military obligations. Thirdly, I will provide a chronological overview of the sources to show not only that the sources that mention these naval obligations are late, but also that they are very few. Lastly, I will discuss these sources which focus on these naval obligations and show that these are not consistent. So, starting with the etymology, adherents of the orthodox view argue that Naukwaros is an archaic uh, form of the word Naukleros, which is a ship owner. They argue that the prefix Nau is derived from Naus, and Kwaros is the archaic form of the word head, hence a ship head. <coughs> this has been challenged by Billigmeier and Dusing, who argue that the prefix is not derived from ship, but from Naus, or temple. He, they argue that this uh, prefix has, has a Mycenaean origin, and as such, the Naquarii are temple heads. Both these positions, well, these interpretations have been criticized. Firstly, when we turn to the temple heads, the prefix now has multiple uses in Mycenaean Greek. So it's quite difficult to pinpoint it. In fact, the prefix is also used for naval-related issues in Mycenaean Greek as well. Secondly, it has also been pointed out that if it truly is Mycenaean in origin, it would have survived a templeless dark age, only to resurface again in archaic Greece. However, there's also criticism of the ship owner interpretation. First of all, now Kleros is a homonym in Attic Greek. It also means landlord or subletter. So even if we accept that Naukwaros is an archaic version of Naukleros, it doesn't really resolve the issue. Moreover, Pollux, one of the two main sources who argues for this naval interpretation of the office, is uncertain about the etymology. He himself implies that he doesn't know. All in all, etym etymological arguments themselves are going to be unsatisfactory. We have to discover the correct answer from different sources, hopefully. So, turning to the military obligations, 
This is once again reliant on Herodotus' description of Carlon's coup, in which the Nakwaroi were a Nemon. So the interpretation of Nemo has proven to be interesting, but as such, the adherents of the orthodox view and a number of revisionists have argued it should be interpreted as to be in charge. This has created also a number of issues. For instance, Thucydides states that the Archons were in control of Athens before the Cleisthenic reforms. So, so it's a bit of an issue now. Uh, what's going on and who is in charge about what? However, Boromir Jordan has argued that Nemo is used by Herodotus to mean to regulate or to place in order. As such, Jordan has, in my opinion, convincingly argued that the Nakwaroi were not in charge of Athens, but rather mediating the situation. As we know, Carlon's conspirators were negotiating with the Athenians, and eventually they were given a deal. They were allowed, uh, they would be spared if they stood trial. Of course, this would, this would go wrong and the conspirators would still be murdered. So, in this context makes much more sense that they are mediating the situation rather than of holding uh, power in Athens. The second argument for any military obligations is the collection of Eisphora. Well, this is mentioned by both the Athenian Politeia and Pollux. However, both these sources which use uh, this word also indicate it's not just used for military purposes. It's used for the uh, for the performance of their obligations. So, despite the fact that Isphora are war taxes, they are used for different things in, uh, in this office. Moreover, Androtion is the only source which explicitly lists an expense, namely funding sacred embassies to Delphi. So, the simple fact that the word Isphora is used is not convincing evidence for military obligations. I will now present the chronological overview of the sources, and before I do so, it's important to notice what Charlotte Schubert, who is a revisionist, has noted. She has argued that the office navalized in the, from the early imperial period onwards. She argues that from Pollux onwards, people start to associate it more and more and more with the navy, and therefore that the naval interpretation is uh, how to put it, an anachronism. So, if you look at the oldest sources, these are the Salonian fragments, Herodotus and Advertion, and the Athenian Politeia. None of these mention naval obligations. This is, of course, the issue with Clydemos, who compares them with Sumorii. I will return to uh, Clydemos in the next section. However, a small spoiler, I, do not, I don't think he is referring to naval Sumorii. This means we now arrive at the long list of Greco-Roman and Byzantine grammarians. The first to mention the Narquaroi is Ptolemaeus the grammarian. And it is clear these terms are being conflated in his time, that Narcleros and Narquaros <coughs> is no longer clear, or people are muddling the terms, but he very clearly separates them. Narcleroi are those who own ships, and Narquaroi are the collectors of public money. A century later, Pseudo-Harmonius is even more explicit. Now Cleroi, Kai Now Karoi, Diaperosin. Ship owners and Nakwaroi, they are different. Now we arrive at Pollux, we've already discussed him a number of times, but Pollux describes the Nakwaroi as local administrators whose Nakwaroya has to provide ships and horses. Then we arrive at Harpacration who describes the Nakwaroi either as Archons or early Demarchs. Then we have Hesychios. He doesn't mention Nakwaroi, but he does mention Nakwaroi. These Nakwaroi are not Nakwaroi, because these are a separate entry in his work. And he describes these Nakwaroi, once again, as early Demarchs. Then we, of course, have the entry in the Lexica Sigeriana, who, which states that the Nakwaro were the providers and commanders of ships. Then we arrive at Photius, <coughs> a couple of centuries later, who states once again that the Nakwaroi were early Demarchs. The Suda also ha 
uh, also mentions in our PowerPoint twice, in which they are once again equated to Archons or early Denmarks again. And lastly, we end up at Thomas Magister, who also notes that there is a difference between the now clear boy and the now boy, and once again emphasizes that the now boy collect public money. So, the now boy have continuously been understood as local administrators, and the only source that doesn't do this is the Lexa Cassegariana. Even for Pollux, despite the fact he mentions the provision of ships, he nonetheless characterizes this as part of the now boy's administrative duties. In fact, I'm going to be more strict in my interpretation than Schubert and say that the office never navalized in the first place. This office has never, by any of our sources, been consistently interpreted as a naval office. If I now turn to the two sources which uh, discuss these naval obligations, we'll quickly notice that they are at odds with each other. Once again, Pollux notes that each Nakravia, the territorial entity, has to provide a ship and two horses. And the Lexa Cassegariana notes that the Nakravoi are the providers of ships and their commanders. In other words, ship providing districts are being confused with ship owners and ship commanders. These aren't the same. Moreover, the Lexa Cassegariana is not necessarily a very reliable source. It uses the verb trirarco to signify that Nakwaroi were in command of ships and therefore is equating Trawarks with Nakwaroi and further suggests that the relationship between the Trawarks and their strategoi was uh, based on an earlier unproven relationship between the Nakwaroi and the Polomark. There was simply no evidence for that connection. It is also here we return to Kleidemos and this comparison between Nakwaroi and Simoroi. Annabelle has already briefly touched on the Simoroi, so I'll be brief on this point. But basically, there are two types of Simoroi. First introduced, the first one was introduced in 378-77 and uh, was set up for the collection of Esphora. The second one was set up in 358-57 and was basically a reorganization of the Triwarchy. Uh, it was set, uh, set up of 20 sections of 60 citizens. Either of these Simorii included only the wealthiest citizens. However, in Kleidemoss' description of a Simoria, something else is going on. First of all, it strongly implied that it includes all citizens, not just the wealthiest. Secondly, he notes that the citizenry was divided in 100 sections. Therefore, it becomes impossible that he is referring to the Triwarki, or the Triwarkic Simoria, I should say. Lastly, he notes that the Nakwarii were instated by Kleisthenes. Yet we know that this is a pre salonian institution. All in all, Kleidemos is not a very reliable source, despite the fact he's one of the oldest sources. So, to conclude about the Nakwarii and these naval obligations, the sources we have for this are both late and conflicting, and of dubious reliability. So, to conclude, the etymology is by itself uncertain. The Nakwaroi do not seem to have had military obligations. A naval interpretation of the Nakwaroi among our sources has never been dominant. We only have two late conflicting sources for this. And this leads me to the conclusion that any naval obligations of the Narquaroi are a modern scholarly convention and that the revisionist critiques are valid. The Narquaroi were local administrators. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you.